Over the course of the A Song of Ice and Fire novels, no POV character has travelled more than Tyrion Lannister. Where has he been, and what does it mean for the rest of A Song of Ice and Fire? Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to In Deep Geek. This video has been co-produced with History of Westeros. Keep an ear out for them later, and please check out their channel and podcast. There's a link in the description. As a boy, Tyrion was fascinated by the writings of Lomas Longstrider, who penned two books on the wonders of the world called Wonders and Wonders Made by Man. The books were given to him by his uncle Gerion, and Tyrion claims, I read them until they fell to pieces. Undoubtedly, one of the exceptional qualities of the pair of books is that Lomas wrote of what he saw personally. This is no compilation of travellers' accounts, rather a first-hand eyewitness account by the author himself. Lomas travelled far and wide to make a thorough search for the most wonderful of wonders, but he also wrote of many other fantastic places that didn't quite make that list. In the end, he named 16 in total, seven of them naturally occurring, nine of them constructed. Though we don't know them all ourselves, young Tyrion memorised each of the Sixteen Wonders down to their numerical ordering. At one point he reminisces on the deep effect the books had on his upbringing. For years afterward, he had cherished a dream that one day he would travel the world and see Longstrider's wonders for himself. When he was closer to manhood, he told his father he intended to tour the free cities and other parts of Essos, as was normal for a Lannister coming of age. Tywin responded harshly, however, saying that given his tendency to embarrass the family, Casterly Rock would not be paying for the trip, and worse, if he chose to go anyway, he would not be welcome to return. So Tyrion understandably backed down. Years later, when pointing a crossbow at his father, Tywin told Tyrion that he didn't have the courage to shoot, and Tyrion famously did not back down. In fact, the impression we get is that, generally speaking, Tywin preferred to keep Tyrion out of sight. So Tyrion's great love of travel was likely stunted by his father's overbearing pride. Still, before the start of the books, he had clearly been to Casterly Rock and Lannisport, and certain other castles around the west. Harren Hall is not unlikely, but not certain either, although he had definitely been to King's Landing and Castle Darry en route to Winterfell, given the memories of the Targaryen tapestries he found in the basement. We'd guess that he's been to Old Town, though Tywin may have shot that one down too, not wanting Tyrion to consort with maesters and such, an attitude similar to the contempt Sam Tarly says his father Randall had for members devoted to servitude. As an aside, Randall and Tywin have much in common regarding the treatment of their sons. Both denied them inheritance, both were quick to shame their interests, and both tried to send them to the wall. Randall succeeded in getting Sam to take the black, but his son is pursuing the life of a maester anyway. Tywin failed in getting Tyrion to take the black quite spectacularly, and it was the last thing he ever failed at. Though the guilt and self-loathing drove Tyrion to nearly take his own life, he did at least finally have the freedom to travel once Tywin was no longer there to tell him no. Fittingly, Tyrion set off for Essos before his father's body was cold. Tywin had said that Casterly Rock wouldn't pay for Tyrion's travel, and that he wouldn't be welcome back if he went. As it turned out, Illyrio Mopatis paid for Tyrion's travels next, and eventually we find Tyrion travelling in his palanquin while eating foods Lomos Longstrider likely couldn't afford. His ordeal just before that was anything but upscale, however. Recall that the first part of this journey took place inside a barrel, not exactly first-class accommodation. Although, a dwarf in a barrel indicates clearly, to us at least, that Tyrion was victimised by George R. R. Martin's love of references to the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit. But we're getting a bit ahead of ourselves. Tyrion's travels began long before crossing the Narrow Sea, so let's jump back to the start of A Game of Thrones and trace his journeys to date. We first see Tyrion at Winterfell, arriving with the royal party after a very long and slow trip from King's Landing through the Riverlands and the Neck and into the north. Shortly after visiting Winterfell, he joins Benjen and Jon Snow on their trip up to the Wall, one of Lomas's Nine Wonders. From atop the Wall, he sets his sight on the Haunted Forest, makes friends with Jon and Joe Mormont, and enemies with Alyssa Thorne. After a return trip to Winterfell, where the direwolves nearly eat him, he gives the Starks plans for Bran's special saddle and heads back south. 
These connections with John and Bran will surely be important later in the story. The link with John in particular is emphasised in the early chapters of Book One, the two part shaking hands and calling each other friend. Tyrion then passed through the Neck and Moat Caelin and into the Riverlands, only to be interrupted at the Inn at the Crossroads by another angry Stark. Catelyn stated loudly that she'd be returning to Winterfell with her prisoner, meaning Tyrion would be making a third trip to Winterfell in short order, but it turned out that Catelyn was just laying a false trail, cleverly taking them to the Vale instead. It did give Tyrion a chance to see another famous castle, the Eyrie, Though not a wonder of the world, as far as we know, it is arguably worthy of that distinction. But Tyrion was still a prisoner, and the sky cells may have contained a bit more scenery than Tyrion would have preferred. However, after winning a trial by combat, he and Bronn set out on the dangerous high road west and travelled to the Green Fork, where Tyrion fought in his first pitched battle and was almost killed when his father left him in the portion of the army designed to take the heaviest losses. Thankfully for him, Rob had earlier siphoned off some of his forces to relieve Riverrun, and the northern forces in this battle retreated a little earlier than expected. After recovering from that battle, Tyrion was sent to King's Landing as acting Hand of the King, where he had his longest stretch in the story of staying in one place. All through a clash of kings he's there, culminating in the Battle of the Blackwater, where he's again almost killed and initially left for dead. And again, all through a storm of swords, where he gets a break from battles to instead face getting framed for regicide, multiple weddings, including his own, and another trial by combat. He remains in the capital until his flight across the narrow sea to Pentos at the end of the book. And that is where Tyrion really gets to explore the world beyond the borders of Westeros. From Pentos, Tyrion set out with Illyrio heading east on the Valyrian dragon roads, which sound a lot like modern asphalt, but probably a bit more magical and dragony, and to the fourth of Lomas Longstrider's wonders made by man. Tyrion passes through the flatlands and the velvet hills, while Illyrio tells him of local legends and history, including the Andals and the hairy men who had been there centuries or millennia earlier. They even see a Valyrian sphinx and the empty spot where its mate sat before it was dragged away to Vaistothrak. This bit of world-building is intriguing, and a cross-reference to Danny, who took a near-identical path from Pentos herself, immediately after marrying Carl Drogo, then later passed along the God's Way to Vaistoth Rack, where the statues of conquered gods and people line the road. Back in the west of Essos, along that shared path, both Tyrion and Daenerys see the dead city of Goyen Dro, long ago devastated by the freehold of Valyria. I am traveling through years as well as leagues, Tyrion reflected, back through history to the days when dragons ruled the earth. For Tyrion and Danny and many others, it may also be a glimpse of the future. More cities may be destroyed by dragon flame or the devastation of the Dothraki horde, and Tyrion and Danny may be side by side for much of it. Here, however, their journeys cease to overlap. The Kalasar struck further east towards Norvos, and then the Forest of Kohor and on into the Dothraki Sea, while Tyrion boards the Shy Maid heading south along the River Rhoyne. Along the Rhoyne, itself possibly one of the unnamed wonders of the natural world, they pass the ruins of Nisar, last ruled by Princess Nymeria. What's left of her palace of green and pink marble can still be seen. Alongside more ruined cities, they passed the Golden Fields and Dagger Lake. Though the sights impress him straight away, at first he is unimpressed by the river itself, but the more he sees, the more this impression reverses. At one point, he states aloud that there's no river like it in Westeros. In another case, it's not his impression that reverses, but seemingly the river itself. In the region known as the Sorrows, Tyrion floats past the Bridge of Dream twice. It's a curious moment that some have put down as time travel, but is probably more the eddies of the river and the magic of the Shrouded Lord. Whatever the truth of the matter, and George R. R. Martin famously wrote, then abandoned a whole chapter expanding on this whole episode, Tyrion is left unsettled by the experience, almost drowned by a stone man, then left with the anxiety of a possible grayscale infection. It is said Prince Garin the Great was responsible for inflicting grayscale on the Valyrian conquerors here in the city of Troy Rain that he once ruled. 
the cities of the Roinar were famed for their exquisite grace and beauty, and Troyrain, called the Festival City, was the greatest of them all. It contained a place called the Palace of Love, but since its destruction, it's been called the Palace of Sorrow. It has a deep effect on Tyrion. The ruin was sad enough, but knowing what it had been made it even sadder. There was laughter here once, Tyrion thought. There were gardens bright with flowers and fountains sparkling golden in the sun. These steps once rang to the sound of lovers' footsteps, and beneath that broken dome marriages beyond count were sealed with a kiss. Through all this, he has followed in his hero's footsteps, as it is known that Lomas Longstrider visited the ruins of Troy Rain in his day. Tyrion misses the next portion of his journey down Mother Roin while he's recovering from his ordeal, but luckily it's a rather mundane section. Then they stop at the walled town of Selhoris, ruled by Volantis since the Century of Blood. He at first thinks of it as a city, as it would be in Westeros, but he corrects himself. Amidst the sights and sounds, he is struck by a thought. This is another world, thought Tyrion, but not so different from the world I know. On cue, Tyrion, unable to avoid Westerosi captors even while in Essos, is abducted by Jorah Mormont, a man from the so-called world he knows. Thankfully for us, though not what Tyrion wants at the time, Jorah wants to head east, which enables Tyrion to see even more new places. Next up is Volantis itself, where they experience yet another of the wonders made by man, the long bridge which spans the very wide mouth of the Rhoyne. It could be called the longest bridge, since it is the longest bridge in the world, and because it is made of fused stone. It appears to have been built using some of the same technology used to create the Valyrian roads and castles like Dragonstone. As with Dragonstone, the long bridge contains many ornamental stone beasts like gargoyles, sphinxes, manticores, and of course dragons. Not long after crossing the bridge to the eastern half of Volantis, they see the Temple of the Lord of Light, the largest temple dedicated to R'hllor in the world. Tyrion is amazed. Seven, save me! That's got to be three times the size of the Great Sept of Baelor. He also catches sight of the famous Black Walls of Volantis, where only those of the old blood of Valyria are permitted to reside. Tyrion, Jorah and Penny, who catches the same boat as them, then take the Selesori Koran to Slaver's Bay and Makoro is seen for the first time. This trip includes passing by Valyria itself, where the doom still holds. The smoking sea is a warning to all. As they pass, Makoro talks about its history and a cold chill runs down Tyrion's back. He thinks of his uncle Gerion, the same uncle who gave him Lomas Longstrider's books all those years ago. Gerion had attempted to sail to Valyria and was never seen again. Tywin had forbidden him to go on that journey as well, and for once Tyrion is grateful to have been held back from travel. The voyage is interrupted by too much wind, which almost drowns them. Then they are left adrift, which almost starves them. Finally, they are found by slavers who take them captive. Despite all this, they still end up in their intended destination of Myrene, where they are sold to the Yunkish lord Yezan Zo Kagaz, aka the Yellow Whale, only for the Pale Mare, the plague, to break out, which almost infects them. Though Yezan himself has died of it, Tyrion has not gone far. He finds himself in a tent still outside Marine with the second son's sellsword company, which is fitting since he is himself a second son and facing another pitched battle. While Tyrion has been going through all this, Danny had climbed on Drogon and flown into the Dothraki Sea. The Yunkish have besieged Marine in her absence, and war is imminent. Tyrion won the friendship of many Vale clansmen much earlier in the story by promising them arms and armour paid for by Casterly Rock, and he came through on that promise, although his promise to give them the Vale itself is still outstanding. In Marine, he does the same, promising the second sons huge amounts of gold from Casterly Rock. Tywin told Tyrion that House Lannister wouldn't pay for his travels, but he may prove quite wrong on that account but so far he's only paid with promises, and Casterly Rock is a long way away. So where else might Tyrion go first? If Daenerys returns to Marine and launches an invasion fleet back to Westeros, and Tyrion catches a lift in whatever capacity, then a return to Volantis, or a flyby, so to speak, is very possible. So is a trip to Dragonstone, and a return to King's Landing and Casterly Rock. 
The North, Winterfell and the Wall may be a step too far, but a reconnection with John and Bran, who he connected with so clearly earlier in the story, must surely be on the cards. We couldn't possibly guess all of it. In any case, Tyrion's travels appear to be far from over. To recap, Tyrion has been in battles, prisons, shackles and the softest feather beds multiple times each. He's travelled in a palanquin and in a barrel. He's been made both Hand of the King and a slave, married a noble and married a commoner. He slew his former lover and his own father. He's been left for dead, saved from drowning, faced multiple attempts on his life and been championed in trials by combat. He's talked his way out of a number of problems and talked his way into perhaps just as many. In the span of the books, he went from King's Landing to Winterfell, to the Wall, back to Winterfell, to the Inn at the Crossroads, to the Eyrie, the Green Fork of the Trident, to King's Landing again, and Blackwater Bay, to Pentos across the Narrow Sea, to the Roin, to the ruins of the Roinar, to Selhoris, to Volantis, to the Great Summer Sea and the site of Valyria, to Slaver's Bay and to Marine. It's quite an impressive list. Despite that list, he still has a lot of work to do if he wants to match Lomas Longstrider, who went to places like Sarnor, the Great Pyramid of Geese, the Bone Mountains, and possibly even Ashai. I think it's fair to say that Tyrion won't get that far in the books we read. But if Tyrion survives the books, and I hope and suspect that he does, perhaps he'll have that chance later. Lannister, Longstrider... They fit together a bit, and it's not the length of your stride that matters, but it's where you go striding, or walking, or riding, or sailing, or barrelling. This video was joint produced with the excellent History of Westeros. Please check out the link in the description for more from them. If you'd like to see more A Song of Ice and Fire videos, please click on the link appearing now on the left of your screen. Or to support this channel and get access to exclusive in-deep geek content, please click on the link to Patreon on the right of your screen. That's all for this time. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again soon.